science and engineering mail servers at UNSW. And as soon as the email addresses started getting notices, of course we got spam. Um, maybe 10, 20 a day. And at that rate, like any other system administrator, I looked at them and traced back through the received lines and reported the spam to the ISPs. I even got a few spammers shut down. Really good. Until one day in late 2004, I got phoned up by the uh, sysadmin at CSE saying, we're getting something like 10,000 bounce messages coming uh, that appear to have come out of your domain an hour. And our mail service can't cope. And nobody else's mail is getting through. What I think happened was that one of those ISPs I sent the spam report to just forwarded the whole spam, headers and all, onto the spammer, who then organized a distributed denial of service attack with bounce messages. I was not happy, nor were any, was anybody else who was trying to use the computer science department's mail servers. So we had to do something. And the rest of this talk is basically about what we did. So, a couple of lessons we learned, and one is don't report spammers directly. You may get denial of service. What's more, we got, we got DOS'd because of all those people who, when they got a mail that looks like it might have come from us, they did generated a DSN, which hit us then. So don't generate DNSs if you can't help it, unless you could absolutely can't help it, because you may be dosing some other poor system administrator. One way of reporting spam without that issue is to use SpamCop. SpamCop.net, um, most of you are probably aware of it already, it's a really neat little website that's been set up by a group of people um, that you can report your spam to, either by um, bouncing it directly to the place or by cutting it out and pasting it into a web form. It then munges it so that your addresses aren't visible, work, passes the received lines faster than I can, and sends emails to the appropriate abuse mail postmaster or whatever mailing list uh, for the uh, ISP in question. What's more, it also keeps a um, statistics on which addresses have been um, reported and has an RBL that you can use as one input into your spam assessment. So that's pretty neat. When I start getting excited, I start talking about RFCs all over the place. Uh, there's two that you need to know about, which if you're running a mail service, you probably already know about. RFC 5321 describes the SMTP protocol. Uh, 5322 describes all the, the headers. And I'd also like to point out this web address here, uh, sput in the Netherlands. It's a good place for XMACLs, but don't use them directly. Uh, use, use a bit of NAUS when you use them. Uh, a lot of the ones that I'm using that I'll be showing later are either ones that are commented out in the standard to be in XM config or they come from here. Um, we need to understand a little bit about how SMTP works. So apologies to all those people who are uh, mail admins. Mail starts when a mail user agent, that's MUT or Evolution or whatever, um, someone types in an email and hits send. At that point it can do one of two things. It can either try contacting directly the appropriate place to deliver the mail, which in general is a really bad idea, or it opens uh, an SMTP conversation with a smart host. The smart host then does a DNS lookup on where the mail's got to go. Come on. Yeah. It tries to look for MX records, which are mail exchanger records. The RFCs say that you can have as many of these as you like, and they are prioritized. And so it returns a couple of MX records. If there isn't an MX record, the smart host can look up an A record instead and use that. The RFC says that then the smart host must use the lowest priority MX record. Bang. That mail exchanger then accepts the mail, does whatever munging it wants to do, and passes it on to some sort of delivery agent, which may or may not be on the same machine or somewhere else. And then eventually the receiving mail user agent picks up the uh, mail by IMAP or POP or directly from the spool file or however you've got to set it up. Now, most people run SM, uh, spam assessment or something like that over here somewhere. But we don't want to do that. 
We want to run it here. Or at least we want to not accept any emails that we're going to have to bounce later, because otherwise we might be dossing some poor sysadmin somewhere. Which means that what we need to do is work out some way of looking at likely spam before we finish the SMTP conversation and try and reject the mail as early as possible. That way, if it is legitimate mail, the uh, sender will get a bounce from his smart host and can do something about it, get you on the phone or something, so you can get whitelisted or something like that. And if it's spam, then you haven't wasted much resources doing on it. I learned this one the hard way too. On my home mail system, because Optus often gets blacklisted by the RBL so I can't get my mail through, I hired a uh, virtual host somewhere in New York. But because I'm a cheapskate, I was only paying $10 a month, and it only had like two meg of virtual memory. Which meant that Spam Assassin, which is a real resource hog, often out of memory the entire Linux host, and no mail got through. The answer is not to run Spam Assassin on most of your messages. So how do you do that? Well, let's have a look a little bit more about the uh, SMTP conversation. The SMTP conversation comes in one of two forms. I'm going to go through the simple one first, then the, then the other one. Hmm? Oh, poo. I, don't, I thought I turned that off. Okay. When you first tell Net to port 25 on your mail server, you get something that looks like that, a 220 message which says, okay, I'm here. This is who I am. I'm ready to go. And so you say, hello, and then you should give a fully qualified domain name, not localhost.local domain. Yeah. Um, it should be something that's vaguely associated with the mail host you're coming from. Um, often because of firewalls and NAT and all that sort of thing, it might be coming from something inside a corporate firewall, and so you can chop off the... the, the you know, if that was fred.joe.com, and Fred was inside the firewall, you might only be able to see that it's coming from joe.com. But there should be some relationship there. A lot of times there isn't, but there should be something. Anyway, assuming that that works, um, the, the receiving mail host will say, okay, I understand that, that's all right. And then you say, mail from fred at joe.com. That doesn't have to have any relationship whatsoever with that. That also doesn't have to have any relationship whatsoever with the from header that comes inside the email. This is the envelope address. If you generate a, de a denial of service notice now, it should go to that address, which means that that address should be deliverable. So, you need to, so maybe we can do a check here to say, OK, is joe.com a real address? Does it have an MX record? Does it have an A record? And if you really want to be paranoid and really annoy the people at joe.com, um, you can do a sender call out to tr start an SMTP conversation. But I'd advise against that because, again, you could be denial of servicing somebody. So, then you get an OK, yeah. Then we say, who are we going to? If you're, smart, if you're receiving MX is not the same as the final delivery notice, it might not, a final delivery site, it might not know all the legitimate things that could go here. It might not know, particularly if it's a second of EMX who's run by somebody else entirely. Which means that at this point you might need to do a call out to find out whether that's valid or not. And eventually you accept, then the data comes through and eventually you, you enter the message and put a dot on the end. There's another form, hello, which is sort of a munged hello. When you say that you get a whole list of options, which is quite nice. The one that I want to point out is this pipelining one. Spammers just want to get out as much, message, uh, as much mail out as possible, and they don't generally obey the RFCs. What pipelining says is you don't have to wait for the 250 or 220 or whatever reply to say that you can go ahead. You can just send the next bit in the SMTP conversation straight away, and it will tell you at the end. So if you turn off the pipelining option at this point and get... And, and, and this is from a, a non-legitimate mail um, M MTA, then it'll just carry on sending and you can reject with a protocol error, V2. 
really early on in the conversation. That gets rid of about 10% of the spam. And it's a really cheap thing to do. If you're running a, uh, an SMTP site that's got to handle oodles of mail for tens of thousands of users, you probably don't want to do this. But if it's just for a small site where you're not handling that much mail, give it a go. Yeah, so spammers don't care about RFCs. So if you insist on strict conformance, it can really help a lot. Uh, unfortunately, some ISPs don't care about strict RFC compliance either, nor do some senders. So, for example, a certain bank regularly sends out mails without a, an RFC compliant date header. Um, and that, for a while, was getting caught in my spam filter as sort of something that was probably going to be spam, uh, and so on. So you have to whitelist those broken ISPs. It's also worth whitelisting, sorry, let me come back there, whitelisting um, sites like vgr.kernel.org or um, lists.herald.co.uk, the, the big mailing list providers, because they get mail that comes in, and even though they do um, spam filtering and stuff on their input, sometimes something gets through. And if your um, mail server is more strict or is more up to date in its, its filter list or whatever, you can start rejecting mess messages that are legitimate as far as the sender is concerned, even though they're really spam. So you, you know, you've got to spam on a mailing list somewhere. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of those places, they desubscribe you if they get a bounce. And that really annoys your users. Yeah, that's right. Now, a couple of observations. The RFC, oh, I put 2821. 2821 is the one before 5321. Um, it's superseded by 5321. They're almost the same content. Accepted mail, you must either deliver it to the end user or you've got to bounce it. Or, or you've got to deliver uh, uh, a delivery failure notice. Which means that you must accept, you must not, uh, you must try really hard not to accept spam. Spam is forge envelope centers and you don't want to denial of service, so don't accept the email that you can't deliver. Because you can't actually obey the RFC and deliver to the original sender because it's forged and it'll go somewhere else. So. Putting it the other way, reject all the email that you're not going to deliver. Oh, <laughs> don't worry about it. Yeah, it's a backscatter problem. It's, yeah. So, first steps. First, gain control of your email. If you're happy running with, with Gmail's thing, then go ahead and do it. But if you're reliant on somebody else's email, then you can't actually control what's going on. So run your own uh, MTA somewhere. Um, another thing that's a, an observation is the RFC says that you should use the, the highest priority MX first. Some spammers try to get around certain buggy systems by using the highest, sorry, the, the highest numbered MX, which is the lowest priority first. Because maybe they think it's got lower spam filtering or something. So it's fairly legitimate to have a, a um, sorry about this. I turned off the screen saver. I don't know what's going on. It's Ubuntu. It keeps on doing things. What? I just said X set S off. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, so, so if you've got some MX records, all the lower one, number ones, you know, zero through 50 are legitimate, then you can put a couple of, say, a thousand and attach them to machines that are just black holes. They just reject everything. Legitimate mail, mail will um, then retry with a different MX if it's got that high. And illegitimate mail will just give up. So, some s checks you can do on the hello. Well, you can check that it really is a fully qualified domain name. Because so many spammers try and use your domain name. Or they use localhost at local domain, dot local domain. You can check that it's got an A record. Um, I wouldn't rely on that for uh, absolute blocking at this point, but it's indicative of, this, of a problem. Um, so you chop off the extra components and see eventually you might get something which has got an A record. Compare it with the pointer record for the sender, but unfortunately far too many people uh, don't have pointer records that are, that are valid. So again, that's just one more input into Spam Assassin somehow. And delay your rejection until after any authorization. So, because you want to, your legitimate users to get through. So, if someone's come in with, um, uh, you know, some kind of authentication to say that they're real, 
then you want to let that through regardless. So I've already said don't advertise pipeline, and that's how you do it. If your user was authenticated, then bypass all the checks. Check the pointer records. Again, because it's broken, just, I just add a, a header, uh, and that can then be picked up by the bees in spam filter later. Thanks. And, yeah, warm, we don't deny. Hmm? Which one? I don't, I, I add a warning message in the headers, which can then be picked up by Bayesian filter. I don't just deny the thing if they don't have a point of record, or the point of records don't match. Pardon? <laughs> no. Yeah. Or you can feed this into a grey list if you want to. Verifying the sender, all I do is check the MX or the A record. I don't actually verify that the sender, um, another thing, some, uh, if, even if you do verify that the sender is there with a call out, which is a really bad idea, because it's more backscatter problems, um, sometimes the sender is, so some, some mail, mailers accept anything that gets sent to them. So you should try it with the random address as well. And that starts getting expensive. So don't do it. Don't upset these innocent third parties because half the time it's forged anyway. If you really must do it, you do it, use really, really generous caches. Uh, so I've got it all commented out in my XM config. Um, instead, um, I just do a verify equals sender there, and all that does is check that, in theory, a DSN message would be deliverable. It's got an MX record or it's got an A record. Um, I also do... A, um, a recipient call out because my MTA is in a different place from where the mail gets delivered. And the um, LDAP database is kind of inside the fire firewall and the, um, the MTA is in the DMZ, so it can't talk to it directly. It needs to do some sort of call out to find out whether the mail's legitimate or not. And the firewall rules make sure that the only thing that the internal MTA can see is the external MTA, so that all works. Now we start to get really heavy, um, here we are. RFC 5321 says don't reject if the RFC 5322 headers are invalid. But we want to reject bogus bounces. Um, this is where some spammer has used your domain as the outgoing envelope address and possibly in the form header as well. And someone's just looked at that and bounced it directly to you. Um, I don't want to get that. What I want to do is to refuse to accept that. Um, so I'm going to vi violate the RFC at this point. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for a receive line somewhere in the body that says it that matches the um, uh, matches the the, the 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 outgoing MX that we've got. You could go more than this, and you could use uh, some kind of cryptographic signature if you wanted to, but I don't go to that trouble. Um, this is good enough for most cases. Other things to think about. Headers should be US ASCII, but uh, after a lot of things, I'm now accepting UTF as well, because there's just too many people out there who violate the RFC and put the stuff in non-ASCII. Always accept email to Postmaster, otherwise you'll get onto the rfc.ignorance.org uh, blacklist. Hmm? And abusive also. <laughs> um, I should point out that a number of the second level domains in Australia are in rfcignorance.org because they don't realise they're just like .com. Uh, so wattle.id.au is entirely, in fact all of .id.au is in the rfcignorance.org blacklist. And grey listing can help, but I'm not going to talk about that today because it's out of scope. And really, really, do not filter your secondary MXs. So if someone else has accepted mail on your behalf and then sent it to you, don't try and bounce it back to them because things are going to go nasty. And you feed to spam assassin after you've rejected 99% of the messages. Okay, so how well does this all work? Oh, hang on. I've already said that. This is how well it works. This is a four-hour section um, from late last year which is when I generated the slides. As you can see, we got 265 messages. We delivered 272. That's because some are generated in internally, mails to, um, the logging, from the logging demon and so forth. We rejected 2,063 messages before it got to Spam Assassin. The 
in the same period, they're not quite the, they, these numbers don't quite add up because spam assassin logs aren't quite in sync with the XM logs. We classify 259 as ham and 71 as spam. That's pretty good, considering we rejected all those. And because we rejected them, any that were legitimate, the people who sent them will know that something went wrong. Why doesn't it recognize that this thing's a real mouse? Oh, yeah. Sorry about this, I'm almost finished. Oh, I hate gnome! <laughs> okay. We're there. Yeah, that's and if you want to get your email through, use your ISP smart host or definitely your own smart host or a static IP, use SPF, use VPN, configure the outgoing MCA correctly so it enables the RFC, and that's about it. Questions or comments, please? Use your own. Yeah, um, that's why I've got my own because I'm with Optus, and Optus is smart hosts uh, not as smart as they should be. In particular, one thing that they do, um, they use round robin. Is there anybody here who's a sysadmin for Optus? Oh, good. Maybe you can fix it. <laughs> one of the things they do, right, is they've got a whole heap of MX records uh, of, of smart hosts, and if the first one. Um, sends to someone which is grey listing. It gets a try again later. And what happens is that immediately the next smart host over goes out and says that and tries tries the message again, which is still grey listed. It's still within the time period. So it still gets bounced. And then it might try another one, I'm not sure. Uh, and then it gives up. No, 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 no. Oh they fixed it, have they? Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't for me. Yeah. Oh, well. That, that, that's okay. That's okay. Providing, providing the, there's a reasonable delay, it should work. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a comment here. So we basically we had a, a fast, really, really fast box sitting in front and a really slow box sitting back as the fallback relay. So you, if you don't, if you go, if you don't go through in the first round, it goes to the fallback relay, which immediately retries fails, and then the, all the remaining retries go from the fallback relay, uh, range. And it also depends on how you do grey, grey listing. I mean, I do grey listing on message ID, not on uh, IP address. Yeah, but spammers are just sending out 10 copies of the same message. Yeah. That, that reject a lot. Okay, any other comments or questions? No, there isn't. Yeah. Uh, actually, most spammers give up immediately um, because quite a lot of them aren't actually sending from their machines. They're using infected machines somewhere across the network, uh, and they're using some kind of ratware that just splurts everything out and then stops. Um, of these ham, um, about 10% are still spam. Over here. That's why we commented on the um, reject immediately rule, like 400 plus message has been done. Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, he tried that, um, and there's some legitimate sites that really don't obey the RFC. Yes. Stop being a really big one for that. Yes. They fixed it now, but we tried it, and I think it was 9 out of 10. We got a mismatched mail because the domain names are similar and it's telling us they can get out instead of there. And when we gave the 418 errors, we say, you know, go away, come again later. Oh yeah. Eight thousand, a ten percent the same email message over a dial-up line. 
Thank you. Too many, too many big brains call for some magic uh, IP tables. <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't have that available at that point. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm out of time. So um, back to the organizers. Okay, thank you very much.